Hello, and welcome to Local Legacies, the show where we go behind the scenes with enterprising individuals who are striving for the best in their business, family, community, and themselves. I'm your host, Tim Lanza, and without further ado, here's this week's guest. All right, welcome back, everybody. Today in the studio, I've got Alex Shinnis here with me. How are you doing today, bud? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, you've got a lot going on, uh, multiple business ventures. Uh, I don't even want to begin a Rise and Grind Cafe. You've got a t- your t-shirt printing business, clothing brand. We're going to get into all of that today. Um, why don't we start with kind of your origin story and how you got going? All right, yeah. Um, well, I'm originally from South Coast, Massachusetts, and uh, I went to school in Beverly, Massachusetts for illustration. So uh, everything I, I thought I was just going to be an artist. I thought I was going to be an illustrator right out of the gate. But uh, things... That, you were Sorry, that was like in high school you were doing art? or Both. both. Yeah, no, in high school, I basically uh, disappeared to the art section and... I was smart enough to get decent grades, but I wasn't really applying myself fully. So disappeared to the art section and uh, kind of by accident put together a portfolio. Um, The summer after my senior year, I I was, I had no interest in, I I really just didn't have any direction. Um, You know, somebody's like, did you know you're going going into business? And at the time I was like, I will, I was so liberal and so uh, artist driven basically that I just didn't think I would ever have a job. I was, I was like, I'm going to go illustrate comic books and, and figure it out, you know, like very naive worldview. Um, also kind of just hiding from growing up at that point. So when I ended up in school, it was, uh, it was actually, my mom just dropped me off at school. Um, she, she enrolled me. It's pretty crazy. So she, uh, I was at a family reunion and, uh, had my girlfriend there and, we were all hanging out in Maine, and then on the way back, she just uh, unloaded me in Beverly and said, you're enrolled here at Montserrat. Like, go go enroll in your classes on Monday. And I was like, oh, okay. So uh, my start was not into business at all. It was I was drawing um, 10, 12 hours a day, painting, sculpting, doing all that stuff. So it was uh, – my start was that, and then – I had a girlfriend who was a graphic designer and she was from the Midwest and didn't have any support there. Um, we moved in together and I just needed to pay the bills. So I took an overnight job. I was working very hard. And eventually I was, after about a year, I was just like, I'm not going to do this. I need to go find real work. So I ended up moving to New York. Um, I called my mom and I was like, Hey, can I get in the family business? And she said, no, you can go get a job for, uh, you know, here's a couple of places. Go apply for a job. Go figure it out. So what what was the family business? Yeah, so it's a manufacturer's rep, independent manufacturer's rep business for decorative hardware, plumbing, and lighting. So it's really high, really expensive doorknobs is the way I say it. Or if, if I'm at a party, I say I sell toilets. And they go, what? Well, you know, they're like $6,000 toilets. Oh, what is that? It's got a lion on it or something, you know? So... Uh, it's it's just really kind of fringe niche uh, product product lines, and the the company is independent. So companies come to our family business and ask us to basically market them. Um, so I asked her for a job, and she looking at me, going, "He's not even suited to work really at this point." I was working at a um, I was working at a pharmacy, so she. Uh, she said, no, here's a, here's a list of a few places. Go, go apply. So I, uh, got a job in uh, great neck, New York, and, uh, it lasted six weeks before I got fired. So that was cool. Uh, renting a house and moving up there, no cell phones at the time. I was, I just moved and my girlfriend was still in school. Um, so it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty rough having her in Massachusetts and me in New York. Um, but You know, I got fired and I went and found another job in the Hamptons. And that's kind of where I found my groove. So I started to learn how to sell um, when I went out to the Hamptons. Yeah. And so your as far as like your family business, is that something that was you 
I don't want to say we're born into because obviously you didn't start out working there, but like, was was there always a family business or how did that no, come to no. be? No, So, yeah, so I'm I'm the oldest of six kids. Um, one of them is a stepchild from my mom's third marriage, so there's five of us. And uh, and my mother was always a very industrious type of person. She would work, um, you know, a night job. Uh, cleaning vegetables was one of her jobs that she had. She'd do the books for some solar company that before there was even really solar that some guy was trying to do it and she would do his books. And, uh, and then she also had a garden that was pretty big. And, uh, and it was interesting because she turned it basically into a bartering system with everybody around in Rochester, Mass. It's at the time there was no stoplights in the town. There was no gas station. Um, there was not much of anything other than maybe a farm. And, uh, and Jonathan Sprouts, where she did wash the vegetables. So she was bartering uh, zucchini and squash and watermelons and whatever for eggs and meat and, and feeding us with it. So it was not – that's how I ended up being so liberal-minded and so artist-driven was I was just around people that were um, commune-driven, you know, and they were they, – they, a lot of them politically were very – liberal as well. So I didn't know any better at that point for, for my own, you know, edification of politics or anything like that. I just grew into it and, and it worked on that small scale. It was nice. Um, but the family business sprouted when I was in high school and that was when my stepfather came into the family and he was, he was always a salesman. So he would, he'd drive around enough red Audi and we were like, well, how'd you get the red Audi? You know, and he's like, well, I sell doorknobs. I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> so then he'd show us the doorknobs and they'd be in the living room in the kitchen and he'd have faucets and lights and all these things hanging around the house. So I saw the business start to grow as I was in high school. But I didn't, I just basically absorbed what they were doing. I wasn't really paying attention. I'm in high school, you know, and I'm kind of trying to like screw off. I'm not trying to learn what they're doing. So it wasn't until later that I thought back and, really kind of realized how much I absorbed with their work ethic and their, you know, what they were doing. So now they grew that business. Did your mom, she, she had kind of a non-traditional, but still very real business background. She's selling, trading, bookkeeping, right. Working basically, it sounds like around the clock. It's yes. And I, it's exactly what I'm doing now. And I blame her entirely. Um, I came by it very honestly. No, it was just effort. Um, she's smart. She's driven. She was the only woman in her space at the time. She was the only one doing decorative hardware. So she ended up like, you know, in a suit with uh, with a briefcase at conventions and people noticed her and she became, she was also very proficient and very good at what she was doing. So she became um, kind of a figurehead. Um, now there's lots of women doing it. Uh, it's almost women driven, to be honest. It's like design driven and women driven, women driven. But at the time, it was kind of architectural, um, which is where my stepfather was uh, primarily ensconced into the architectural side of things, and he really understood how everything worked. It's a great team. Um, so yeah, it was it was observation of of her work ethic. Um, no, I mean she went to school for marine biology. I think it took her thirty years to get a degree. So. You know, she just did it just to do it when she got older to get the degree. And it's kind of like me. I don't have my degree. Um, I kind of followed in her footsteps almost entirely without even realizing it. So now it's just pure effort. Wake up and try to figure out how to solve a problem. That's all. Isn't it funny how that happens? Like you're not trying, obviously, or not, you may or may not be trying to emulate someone, but then you look back and you see the path that you've taken. Who, who could have taught you better? Like who else are you going to trust to? But also it's DNA, right? Like I can't help it. Right. And I think that there's something that, you know, I think about this a lot with my parents. Both of them have been very strong influences on me. And I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that they pounded into my head when I was a little, but I didn't realize at the time. No, you don't, you don't ever. And then you see the way you see the world and yeah. you're like, oh, this is where this came from. Is yeah. that influence throughout your entire life growing up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I see the world quite differently from the rest of my family now, but um, I, I understand exactly where they're coming from because I, I grew up that way and then now so you're in the Hamptons what what were you doing there yeah so the Hamptons was a, a great experience for me 
for a few reasons. One, um, the the clientele was prolific and they were plentiful at the time. This is 1999, 2000. Um, very rich, very um, capable of buying anything you anything you show them. And I was in one of the best showrooms in the country for that. So I had no problem. I had no price barrier. And I was brand new. So I, I if I just walked in and pointed at a towel bar and said, $500, they were like, cool, write it up. So I was selling a lot of stuff right off the bat. But I also started to kind of learn my way around the product lines, how much um, I, had a, I had a good guy teaching me. That, that was a manager there, kind of learned where the profit margins were and how good the product line was, if we were going to get a call back about a problem, all that stuff. So I, I kind of had my education really fast, um, but I sold a lot of stuff in a year, and I went to the guy who owned the shop, and I said, uh, you're paying me $32,000. i am driving in an hour and a half. I'm selling over a million dollars. Actually, I think it was 800000 the first year, which was a fair amount. And uh, I was like, can I get a raise? And he was like, no. He's like, I'll, I'll buy you lunch every day. Like, he made me get like dollar me- dollar meals and stuff like that. And he was like, give you four bucks or something, get cheeseburgers. And I was like, ah. I don't know. So I found this boutique spot in the town I lived in, but it was tiny. It was, uh, I don't even know, 800 square foot place. And the guy had just bought it. And uh, he's a very charismatic guy. Um, I walked in, he looked at me. He was like, knew I wasn't shopping. Can I help you? And I was like, looking for a job. He goes, well, what do you know? What do you, what? I said, I worked at Architectural Details in the Hamptons. He goes, you're hired. I was like, okay. So how much money do you want? I was like, 42000 He was like, done. I was like, okay. He's like, you start tomorrow. I was like, yes. So now I had to drive five minutes to work. Instead of getting up at five and getting there for 6.30, I was waking up at seven and getting there for 7.15 you know, eight, eight o'clock, whatever. Like I was just rolling out of bed and going to work and getting paid more. And, uh, it was, it was a relief. Um, but that place was where I learned how to really learn how to sell. Um, and that's where I kind of learned about being a proprietor too, like a, like a shopkeeper, because what ended up happening was the owner would, the best thing that worked for us was for him to get out of the store, just, just leave and go, go where the PGA tour goes and hobnob with the rich. His sister was incredibly rich. She had a picture of her and Julia Roberts on on her fridge. I remember being at her place and uh, the fireplace was like 40 feet high. I'm like, this is kind of a nice house. And, uh, and she was prettier than Julia Roberts also. Um, So she had all this money and he had, he had these connections. So it was better if he just went and dealt with that and sent, sent me phone numbers, call this guy, you'll sell him some stuff. Um, so I did all the sales. So, so clientele was similar to the Hamptons. Like it's still selling it was high end more stuff. New York city, which there is a distinction. It's the same people to a degree, but the New York city crowd is buys a little differently. Probably not interesting enough for this, uh, for this podcast. But, um, the, the basis of it, the, the lesson for me was to learn how to sell to the long Island crowd. Um, because Ray, the owner would go off with the New York people and he'd send us stuff back But the long Island crowd was who was coming in every day. And, uh, and this is now right after 9-11, so there's kind of a strange fog over everything, but there's also these very, very rich people because people don't remember how well the markets did after 9-11. They really kind of pumped for a while, and people were spending on their homes. So we had this opportunity to sell a lot of decorative hardware to newly rich people. Um, and I settled into a uh, kind of a – it's – almost embarrassing to talk about because it wasn't really a great way to treat people, but it, it helped me to identify newly rich people as, um, like how they felt about me when they came into the store, they'd look at me and they'd say, well, this guy's just gonna, you know, he's going to serve me. And I, I would put them kind of at odds with that by agreeing with them about their choices and saying, that's what I have at my house. And they would go, well, that, that can't be like, I need something better than what you have. Obviously kid who works in store, you know, so what else do you have? And I'd say, well, I've got this room in the back. It's got expensive stuff in it. You need an appointment. They're like, well, I don't have time for that. Like bring me in the room. All right. Bring them in the room and show them the expensive thing. And they're like, just write it up. You know, you're wasting my time, kid. Come on, write it up. And so I would write, 
really tremendously big orders, um, almost by insulting them, by saying I was as good as them. Um, and it worked incredibly well for too long, but years. Um, so that was, that was my tact, and that was kind of where I learned how to, I hate to say manipulate people because they were getting a great value. They were getting fantastic product, but they were definitely buying over their head. Um, and that was my job. My job was to get them to maximize the dollar at, at their sale, right? So, Well, and also, you know, you talk about what they're getting out of it. Like if you, if their concern was like, actual value let's say like you yeah. could probably buy something at just home depot that right. would do the job for years yeah it would have sufficed fine but they want their value to them is like the perception whether Status. it's like your perception of them or like when they have their friends come over for a party and they're yep. like oh wow nice you know nice towels it's like well those are five grand yeah 100%. just to be able to that, say that that's exactly what was happening actually um i had a, a really funny like unforgettable experience with, with that happening with one lady. She came in and she said, I was at a party and I saw a tub and, um, and it was really nice. And I think it was by this French company. I said, Oh yeah, I know what that is. That's, that's a herbo tub. And she said, yeah, it was a clawfoot tub, copper with gold lining. I was like, yep, I got it. She's like, well, how much is it? And I, I think it was, I forget how much it was, but it was like something like $32,000 and, and more to ship. And she said, well, no, I don't really want that. I want something better. I was like, I don't, I'm looking through the catalog and I'm like, seems like that's the biggest thing they've got, you know, the best thing they've got. So we'll call them. I was like, okay. So I, I waited until nighttime and called France and I was like, all right, so what do you got that's better? And they said, well, we don't have anything better, but we can put platinum in it. I was like, I just need it to be more. I'm like, yeah, well, we'll platinum line it instead of gold. Okay, and it came out to fifty or sixty thousand dollars after after all the stuff, and then to ship it. And she was like, "Great, perfect." And all she really wanted was to put the receipt out when her friend came over, and be like, "Oh, I got the same." Oh, maybe it's not the same. It's is this the one you got? You know, and show them the receipt. They just want to rub it in each other's faces a little bit, and it's it's almost good fun for them. And like you said, it's status. So the value to them is something different than what it is to us um, entirely. So I wasn't, and I wasn't selling them snake oil. It was legitimately a fantastic tub. It was just, you don't need it. Right. Well, it's, and then you come from an environment, like you said, a commune-driven environment where you're, you're trading. We're sleeping in the, we're, we're, we're bathing in the actual tub from France from like 60 years ago. Right. That right, cost right, right. us 40 cents. And you're trading <laughs> things of, of lower financial value, but of greater personal value. Like when you're talking about trading food and commodities sure. and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I guess that's kind of the point right like is everybody perceives the value of things differently um that's something i run into now that like i realized after i left the hardware business um on the retail side of it um and now i sell coffee and i sell smoothies and t-shirts and things of lower dollar dollar values and i also try to make i'm still trying to make the most bougie coffee i can make and the, and the best printed T-shirt, like, I'm not trying to compete with the guys across the street at all. I'm probably more expensive. I don't even look at what they charge. I don't know. But I'm not trying to make just your basic thing. But my customer is value-driven in a way that's like, how much is your smoothie? Well, it's 9 to 10 bucks. Well, what's in it? All right, let's get into that. And we'll talk about it, right? Like, why I'm better than the other guys. But it's a totally different conversation. I'm not sitting down and belittling my, my, uh, my customer, right. you know. We're having a real conversation on pretty much equal terms. And actually, a lot of times, they see me as a superior in some ways. And I'm not used to that. I'm used to being the guy who they, I know my customer is looking at me like, like I'm below them. So now I'm like trying to put myself on equal footing with my customer and explain to them in a way that they feel like they're equal with me so that then they can feel valued. And that's a totally different thing. It's something I've had to relearn in terms of sales. Um, but it's going pretty good yeah now you're so you're selling in new york starting to build up your skill set selling tactics and i'm assuming some money as well um where do you go from there yeah so i was in new york for about 10 years and um it was uh it was a rough experience to leave because i was doing really well there but my wife wanted to move back to the midwest um and we looked at a couple of different places. 
we were looking at Kansas and Missouri and, and Colorado. And we actually looked at North Carolina, too, because there was some family there. But uh, we settled in the, in the Colorado area. That was where we both felt the best mutually. And uh, so I put out my feelers to a number of showrooms that were out there. I didn't really – I wasn't really at a point in my life where I could go out on my own entirely, especially not in a new place. Um, so I put out my feelers for um, showrooms in the area that carried the product line that I was representing. Um, and I got a really – uh, enthusiastic response from three or four different places. And they ended up getting in a bit of a bidding war over my services because it just so happened that out in Colorado, they were only selling my product line and one other. It was either like stainless steel or my stuff, which was bronze. So they, I had a bit of a bidding war. I ended up in the Aspen Valley and uh, it was, it was a good experience at first. Um, the, the country is beautiful. It's every day is just kind of tremendous to wake up on a mountain and go to Aspen or go to Vail. Um, feels totally liberating when you're uh, when you're coming from New York, where there's you know thirty thousand people when you walk out your door, and in the Aspen Valley, there's thirty thousand re- year-round residents in the entire valley. So it was initially very liberating, and then pretty quickly kind of isolating, and then absolutely horrifying when everybody knew what I was doing after two weeks or three weeks. It was like people knew I was the new guy. (laughs) So it was very strange. Um, But yeah, so I ended up in Colorado. So now that you're in Colorado, like you said, there's 30,000 people in the Valley versus like an enormous amount of people in New York City. How did that affect your life and also like the way you were doing your job? Right. So in New York, people were teeming out of your ears. They were just coming out of every, you know, nook and cranny. And you didn't have to follow leads as aggressively. It was just, you know, you make a phone call and, like, stuff starts happening. Um, in Colorado, you have very rich clientele in the Valley, but you, um, you – they're, they're insulated. You can't talk to them. You can't get a hold of them. And even their buyers are tough to get a hold of. So um, – the fundamental biggest change was that I was a fully commissioned salesperson. So I'm, I'm working, um, on a draw. So I'm offered a certain amount of money on a draw, but if I don't hit my sales goals, I able the money. Um, so just to, so for anyone listening, so like you're getting paid every week. I got paid biweekly. Yep. Or every other week. Yeah. Yep. And then you're expected to kind of like almost reimburse the company quarterly. Okay. Yeah. So if you, and so, yeah, and it's a fairly standard practice with high-end salespeople, um, and it was the one I chose. It was the, the, the route I chose because when I was in New York, um, the reason I ended up leaving um, the showroom and you know going out on my own in New York as a rep was because I saw that I wasn't getting paid. Um, I, I worked my way up to about $60,000, but I was selling well over a million dollars in hardware, and then I spoke to people and they said, well, you should be getting over a hundred thousand for that. You should be getting roughly 10% of what you're selling unless it's tiny margins. And I said, no, it's pretty good margins. So now you should get a lot more money. So I went to him and I asked for more money and he said, well, I'll put you on commission. And he fabricated this really complicated commission structure. Um, and the first month I made like $12,000 and the second month I made like $13,000, which is a lot more than I was making. And he sat me down. And he was like, I can't pay you this. I just can't pay it. And I was like, well, what do you want to do? It's like, you got to partner me. We got to open a second store. I had all these plans. I was like, let's go, let's do it. And I'm like 23, you know? Um, and he's like, I, I just, he's just like having a great time making some, mo- you know, making some money for, you know, for free, basically. Like he's no, not, this is in the Hamptons, right? No, this is the or... one that's on Long Island. Okay. Gotcha. The Hamptons are on Long Island, yeah. but this is, this is, uh, in Huntington, which is like kind of middle, middle North shore of Long Island. Um, so we had a very, very amicable, friendly split. He bought me like a really nice Louis Vuitton briefcase, which I didn't even know what it was at the time. I was like, Louis, okay. And like, I ended up selling it years later for like thousands of dollars. When I put it on eBay, I was like, holy, I can't even believe how much this was. So he was really generous. He would like kind of taught me generosity in, in certain ways, but he wasn't generous enough or smart enough to um, pay somebody what they were worth. 
You know, he just didn't see the he didn't see the value in that. This is actually that's a whole other podcast is like the value of employees. Right. So. Um, so I, I left, I went to work for my family at that time and I worked for my family from 2003 to 2009. And then that's when I left New York, um, mostly because my wife wanted to. So the job I took was a back in retail, but it was, it's a totally different ball game out there. The retail situation is not like it is in New York at all. And it's connections driven. Um, I didn't really know what I was getting into. There was a couple of factors happening all at once that I wasn't privy to. One was the guy who hired me was going bankrupt, didn't know it. Um, He had a lot of cash on hand, but it was also a lot of debt. So it was kind of hard to notice because he was living a certain lifestyle that looked great. Um, He gave me a big cash bonus, paid me literally in cash. So um, I thought I was in a pretty good situation. I took a totally commissioned job with a draw and promised a number that was pretty high. Um, and I was fully confident that I'd hit it. But in the first few months, he took advantage of that by using my services to build a showroom and outfit it with the newest hardware. Cause I was the specialist for this. Um, so he was kind of double dipping. He was like getting a salaried thing out of me thinking, I'm just going to pay him back. Cause I'm not going to hit sales. So he's like, I'm just working for free. Really? I, I got wise to it. Like two months in took me a little while. I was like, nobody's coming to the showroom. And he was pretty shifty, so he wasn't going to say anything. And I realized it one day, and I said, "Uh, all right. So I called him up on a Monday morning, and I said, I'm not coming in. He said, what do you mean? I was like, not coming in pretty much ever. I'll come in with my orders. I'll do whatever I can to, you know, to stop in and make sure things are good on my end with my orders. But I'm not going to be selling out of the showroom anymore. And uh, what I noticed every time I was driving into work was, There'd be trailers um, at the job sites. These job sites are enormous, like really big houses. And there'd be trailers there, and people would be there at 6 a.m. You'd see them, like, pulling up in their trucks and, you know, starting working. So I said, I'm just going to go there when they get there in the morning. Um, So, um, and I'd never done this type of cold calling in my life, but I was kind of desperate. I knew I was going to owe them a lot of money if I couldn't get sales. Um, The other thing I hadn't really thought about and nobody was even aware of at the time was this is right during the 2008 housing crisis. So the Valley there hadn't really felt it yet. And no one had, to my knowledge, had like really understood what was happening yet. Talking about the foreclosures and stuff like they weren't really, we're on the cusp of the bubble. And uh, so this was all happening and the billionaires are freezing up because they know, but we don't know. So we're all kind of looking at each other like, why is this so hard to get an order? You know? Like this stuff used to be not hard and now it's, you know, they're, they're really pinching us for every, every penny. So I went to the job sites at six in the morning and, and I knocked on the door and I was like, Hey guys, I'm working over here for these guys. And you know, I'm from New York and I work with this product line that you use and I want to help you guys. And they're like, we don't need you. You know, I'm like, well, give me a set of plans. All right. Well, the, I don't really have an extra set. Like, well, I'll go make a copy. Like, well, it's, you know, four inches thick. It's like, it's gonna, you know, I'm like, all right, I'll go print a copy. It's like, that's gonna cost you like eighty bucks. Like, okay, I'll pay for it. Okay, sure. Email you the file. Go, I'll go print it. And I would sit in a Starbucks for ten hours and do a right, you know, do a walkthrough of the entire property, and basically as if I already had the job, and write every opening, every detail way more than they were expecting to get and, uh, and hand them back a packet. I would have two packets, one with numbers on it where they could see product codes and one without that just had a price at the end. And I handed them both. And I said, this is really competitive. I'm within a few percent of anyone else. I'm, I, I feel dirty. I'm giving it away. Um, and I'm also doing way more work than I have to. You're an idiot if you don't use me. And they looked at it and they were like, you know, you're right. We're going to give you a shot. It took a while to get a shot from one of these guys because they're used to ordering from the same guy for 15 years. And it's like this new kid who's 20, you know, nine at the time walking in. Okay. Uh, looking like a New Yorker driving, <laughs> driving a BMW, which I got hazed for relentlessly in Colorado. 
Um, and they were just, and it was an SUV. It was at least an SUV, but they were like, this, this guy just doesn't fit. And I really didn't fit, but I was relentless. I just, I was so desperate that I was not going to make my number and I was going to have to pay them back all this money. It was going to be like all of the money I had if I didn't get the, you know, get the sales. So I just worked extra hard and put these things together and I started getting some contracts. I got this one builder who gave me like three houses at once. And, uh, it, those three houses leaped me. I was like three months behind and it put me up to speed. So for me, it was like a race against time the whole year I was there. And, uh, I, with a, with a few weeks to go in the year, I hit my number. And unfortunately my, my relationship was unraveling. It was just a really hard situation all around for me, but I hit my number and I, I walked in and said, guys, I hit my number. Thank you so much. I'm not going to be coming back. And they were very upset about it. Um, and, and that was the end of my Colorado experience. I went home shortly after, um, but it was a huge learning experience about, again, value, again, how to like pinpoint what people really actually need and give it to them, you know, because that's what it's all about. If you don't do that, you're dead in the water. You just don't have a chance. Well, and it sounds like you, you've got a different buying situation out there where there's like a middleman between you and the end user. So now you've got to figure out, well, not what's the value for the end user, the person who's going to be in their house, but what's the value for the person who's actually make you're making the deal with, which is yeah. either, I'm assuming, a GC of some sort. The GCs or- out there are incredibly sophisticated. Um, and then there's they have subcontractors doing their work. Um and that's the guy buying from you. And they are so good at squeezing every angle out of out of the the sellers. And they're very good at not paying at the end. And they have virtually no ethics about it. So it's the Wild West for real. Like for real. And uh, it was just a huge learning experience all the way around for me to, to encounter that and, and formulate a strategy that would work. And not make me the guy being hung out to dry, you know. So I like I left Colorado by the skin of my teeth. I really did, um, but I made it. And then what happened when you came back out here? Um, I self destructed for like two years. I, I guess I wouldn't say that so much. Um, I didn't have a job for two years after that. I didn't. I didn't. I should have just bought an apartment and got a sales job and like chilled for a little bit because I had a fair amount of money at the time after my divorce was final. I was. You know, the house was sold and everything was done. Um, It was just, I was in okay shape. Um, But instead of doing that, I just gambled every day. I played played poker every day. And uh, I did fine at poker, but it was the the lifestyle that made me spend more money than I was making. And then ultimately, I didn't want to work very much. I was just like, I'll play two days a week and make enough money for that. And then, but I'm not going to stop going to steak dinners. And if somebody says, hey, I got a limo to Providence, I'm like, I'm gone. I'm in. So it, you know, I was partying a little bit and, uh, buying clothes. I wouldn't even wash my clothes. I would just buy new ones. It's like stuff like that. I was, I was doing the divorce guy thing that had a little bit of cash. And I did that for a couple of years until I had much less cash. And then I, uh, I had a little bit of a wake up call. Um, I, I did, I did meet my second wife and in, in the middle of that, and there was, you know, we were on and off for a bit, but eventually I settled down and we, you know, had our children and got married. That happened a few years later, but, um, I ended up going back to the family business. It was comfortable for me and I was, you know, effective. So, um, so I went back into that for a while, but, um, I didn't kind of catch my stride until my son was conceived. And I was, I was just sort of floating after Colorado. Like I had a very high output life as a salesperson until I got divorced. And then I had this kind of waifish um, period for a couple of years. And then after that, it was hard for me to catch my bearings for a couple more years where I wasn't like as effective as I was before. And I wasn't as motivated as I was before. And then I had my son be conceived and it kicked me in the ass and was like, I'm going to need some money. Like I took inventory of what I had spent and what I would need. And I went, I'm going to need a business. So I started coaching, which was just kind of out of left field. Coaching? Bodybuilders. Okay. Yeah. So during this whole time, my hobby has been competitive bodybuilding and on and off for, 
at that time for about 10 years, I had, I had been doing competitions and, uh, I, I had helped a couple people get ready for shows for free, just kind of helping them. Cause I, you know, I'd be in the gym and see them working and I'd be like, I can help you, you know? But then when my son was conceived, I was like, maybe I can make like a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks a, a month, just helping a few people. So I put up this ad on a forum that I would like back then it was, everybody was on forums for probably for cars. It's the same thing. It was like, you'd go on a forum and find a weird car part that you were looking for and everybody on there would know all about it. So you'd learn like, you know, deep details about that thing. For sure. That's what it was like for bodybuilding. Um, and I'd spend my, my spare time really kind of studying. I would be on PubMed studying um, articles about hypertrophy and just, it was kind of consuming me in, in a way that was non-monetary at the time. So I was like, I'm going to, you know, try to use this. So I put up an ad and uh, I don't know how quickly it happened, but within the first month I made much more than $2,000. And I was like, well, this is interesting. So uh, I started putting up more ads on more forums. And before long, I was coaching 50 people. And I'm like, I'm only charging like 125 a month, but like, that's real money, you know? You're like, oh, I'm making... Times 50, that's real yeah, money. Yeah, it's real sure. money, yeah. So I'm like, well, I have an art background. I'm going to make some T-shirts. So I designed some T-shirts and did the, you know, direct fulfillment stuff where you just kind of stick it in the in the in the website and they order it and you get a 10 bucks every time they order a t-shirt so and all of a sudden i'm selling like 100 t-shirts i'm like i'm making some money doing that all right well that's cool so then i hired a new designer to do some more t-shirts and i all of a sudden i had a clothing brand i'm like all right well i'll put a website up for that and i still start selling a few things there and then i get more clients so all of a sudden within three years four years i've got 85 90 clients revolving and I've got a clothing business where they all want a hoodie or a T-shirt or a hat or whatever. Um, so I'm, it's it's a real thing at this point, and it seems sort of sustainable. So here we are back to the value thing, right? It's like now the value for these people it's different per individual. Now I'm having an experience where it's like some people I'm having daily conversations with because they want a therapist. And some, some people are very hardcore and they just want to be told what to do. Um, and then there's, and I start having competitions, you know, people are having competitions and their results matter. You're not going to get hired if your results aren't good. So it becomes highly competitive. So it's consuming a lot of my time. Um, and I'm still doing the family business at this time. And thankfully they're giving me the, the space to be able to do both because they realized that I need the money and that I'm doing well. And my parents have always been incredibly supportive of that. They were always like, you've always got a position here. We'll pay you X percent just as long as you run and go to New York if we need you or whatever it is that we need you to do, you go do it. You know, take over the emails. My mom's in Jamaica right now. I'm doing her emails. Um, and and I always have a percentage of that business, which has saved me. My, you know, my entire uh, time that I've been going out on my own, I don't have to rely on making that income every month to make my my bills. I can always kind of, I know that I'm going to make some money. So, um, but that coaching thing went amazing. I'm still coaching, but I've only got 40 people now. I charge twice as much, but the money is not the same anymore as we were talking about earlier off the air. Um, you know, a cheeseburger is 15 bucks now. So right, it does, definitely doesn't go as far. Yeah. It's not the same. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I ended up doing after Colorado. And, uh, it kind of paved the way for me to kind of do what I'm doing now, um, get into the, you know, it gave me the space and I had the income and I had my days free so that I could actually build a screen printing business without getting paid by it and a cafe without getting paid by it. So how did the, yeah, how did the screen printing business come about? So Mark was, Mark's my partner for both the screen printing and, uh, and, and rise and grind cafe. Um, and he was one of my clients at the time he was doing bodybuilding shows quite successfully, by the way, he's a prolific poser. He's very, very good, uh, athlete. And he came up to me and he was like, Hey, I want to do a custom shirt. And I was kind of like annoyed with shirts at the time because the designers were costing me money and I wasn't really, uh, able to spend my time on it the way I wanted to. So it was just kind of like a net zero thing for a while. So I was like, absolutely not. I don't want to do any custom stuff not interested. 
So he came back around and he was like, yeah, I've been taking these courses. I really want to get into something like, you know, self-employed. And I was like, sounds good. You should probably think about that really deeply. And he was like, what about the t-shirt thing? And I was like, what are you asking me? He's like, we should do the t-shirt thing. I was like, I don't want to do the t-shirt thing. He's like, well, I don't know. He kept bugging me for like weeks. But finally, one day I was like, I looked it up. I was like, okay, you have to buy screen printing equipment. I was like, there's no way we're going to do it the digital way where it costs us all this outsourcing cost. It's like, we got to buy the equipment and then we need a place to print it. And then we need the time to print it. He's like, we'll do it in my house. I was like, what? It's like, yeah, the dark room will be my, uh, my, my second bedroom. And then the living room will be the, the print lab. And then downstairs in the basement, we'll print the shirts. And then the rest of the basement will inventory the screens. And I'm like, you're crazy. He's like, yeah, no, we'll do it. So we took a class in New York. We drove up to New York. We took this two-day class. It sucked. It was so bad. It was like, it was like our shop right now where you walk in and it's mayhem. And, and you can see everybody's like, working so hard and they're stressed and they're cleaning screens and they're fixing stuff and they're, everyone's moving a mile a minute. And I, I watched it and I was like, I don't want to do this at all. I, was like, I don't want to do that. And he was like, no, just take the class. And so, you know, we printed some shirts terribly, whatever. The whole thing was just hard. And, and we were, we left, went to a bodybuilding show in New York went to a pro show, which was fun. And then we're driving home and there's like two hours of silence. And, uh, like, I'm sitting in the passenger seat at this point. I remember him driving. I look over at him, and his face is just like, Meh. like He's just mad. And I'm like, uh, I don't think we're going to do this. And then, like, two hours in, like, the ego's kicked in. I was like, Mark. I was like, what? I was like, we could totally do this. I was like, I know. I was like, you see those people in the class? Like, yeah, they were idiots. Like, they were idiots. That guy had a shop already. He was just learning some, like, new technique. That other lady had this website and the whole, like, they all, like, we're better than them. He's like, we're better than them. Yeah, for sure. By the time we got home, we, like, basically had punched the order in. And it was like, well, there goes 35 grand. Like, just ordered the stuff. We basically did it, like, just because we were mad. And then, you know, and then we kind of sat around. We're like, welp, for, like, two weeks until it showed up. We were like, welp, looking at each other, like, what do we do? What's going to happen? Stuff all arrived. And uh, I'll never forget walking this like neon green giant contraption down uh central street on a pallet with wheels and people driving by like the bottlenecking and craning their heads like what the it looked like a nuclear bomb and we walked it into mark's back backyard disassembled it put it in his basement and we were like so proud of ourselves we had no idea what we were getting into like how hard it was going to be we kind of did but like we're still just trying to figure out how to print right. It's four years later, right? So, and we have a nice big shop and we've got all these employees and we're still like, like every morning we wake up and we're like, we gotta figure out how to print this crazy design we just, we just made. Like, it's a struggle every day. It's a hard business. So that's how that happened. Mark, Mark talked me into it. It's totally his fault. And then somewhere in, the, in that timeline, we had this opportunity to open the cafe, which, which was really just a, happy accident really it was like we needed an outlet for t-shirts that we were making so we had like fifty thousand dollars in the inventory of our own brand and we had nowhere to really sell it because covid happened there's no shows there's no trade shows there's nothing happening so just just to clarify with the t-shirt business you're printing you get your own clothing line your own clothing brand rather and then you're also printing for other people as well yeah so initially we weren't going to print for anyone else we were just like, we're going to make our own brand. We're going to make a million dollars. Obviously, we're awesome, so it'll work. And it didn't work. So, But what did happen was we printed really great stuff, one of the one of the shirts you're wearing right now. It's actually a crazy shirt if you look at it really up close. It, that shouldn't be possible the way we printed it. I'm very proud of the printing we do. Um, so we were doing all of our own stuff, and then a guy at a trade show, trade show saw one of our designs and was like, who printed this for you? We did. You printed this? Like, yeah. Us two bozos. We did it. It's like, oh, okay. Well, you want to do a job for this other guy that I got? It's like, yeah. All right, we'll do it. And I remember, I can't, I'll never forget it. We, we ripped out this, this order over a weekend and we were like, we made a thousand bucks. You know, we looked at each other. We, we made a thousand bucks. It was like two days. It's $250 a day each. It's not like 
groundbreaking by any means, but we were like, made a thousand bucks. So uh, we put it online. We're like, we need a name. What are we going to be? We're the Super Metal Bros, because they had a metal clothing company. I was Team Metal Athletics. I was like, we're obviously the Super Metal Bros. We didn't think about that at all, like how silly it was going to sound down the line. But uh, and we're like, let's make some cards and an Instagram page. Okay. But kind of like the coaching, it kind of caught fire kind of quick. Um, and we've got one machine, and uh, not we don't have a whole shop. So all of a sudden, we're overloaded with orders for what we're capable of putting out. So we pivoted. We were like, let's just scrap this clothing brand and go towards the printing for other people, since it's obviously lucrative. Um, so that's what we did. And that actually funded the cafe. And now the cafe is helping fund the larger print shop. It just kind of goes back and forth. So that's it's honestly all just... Uh, opportunities that pop up and um, we don't know how to do any of the things we do before we do them. We Google it, call up people that do it, ask them how to do it, bring them down. And then the key I think is to be patently unimpressed with anything you're doing. If you're just really unimpressed with the first time we made a shake, we were not happy. And then, so we decided to like make a shake lab and, take two months to learn how to make shakes because what other way is there to do it you know and we're doing the same thing with coffee right now so it's like we will have the best coffee around we will um but we have to learn how to do coffee first well i think that with people in general you know you're the biggest killer is just inaction right so you're never going to be any worse at doing something than like right before you try it yeah and every time you do it, you're going to get better and refine the process. And even though you have no experience in the area, you start doing something. I mean, I've experienced this through doing this podcast. I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. I had to get music for the intro and art for the logo. And, like, I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to have the conversation. And you realize now there's infinite levels to doing it better. Right. And which now, is what you learn as you go. You're like, well, we do everything terrible. Right. And then you have a ba- – at least you have a base though, right? Yeah. And then you can say, how can we tweak this and make it better and build off of it? And then, like you said, you've got new ventures that are – you're like bouncing back and forth upon one another or supporting one another to help grow your whole umbrella of business. This is where it ties back to my mom. It's like, uh, watching her just do things and they didn't always work, but just, just watching her do it, you know, was, it gave me the confidence to just try, you know? So, and that, that's what it is. You have to be willing to like, just do, you know, you can't you can't plan too much. If you sit around and plan it forever and don't do it, you're never gonna never gonna accomplish anything. Right. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing is like as you're saying this, I'm thinking about that clip that Jim Carrey has with his dad, where he's talking about how his dad gave up his dream uh, as a comedian or whatever he was gonna he said he was a very funny guy, but he left and became an accountant. And then when he was when Jim was twelve years old, uh, his dad lost his job and he's like, Well, I learned then that you can fail at the thing you didn't want to do. And uh, and that stuck with me. Like, as soon as he said that, I was like, that's what I'm avoiding. Like, if I fall on my face doing all this stuff, at least it's stuff I really enjoy and I want to do, right? Because I can fall on my face doing anything else. And I would hate doing it every day. You know, this is challenging. It's really hard. Um, and it's probably way more than, like, you know, a normal job would be way less effort um, and would would reward you more in the short term. I was going to say in certain ways. In the short term. But people don't see see it that way. Like employees don't see it that way and and customers don't see it that way because most of them have jobs. So their their idea of a value in a job is is kind of like linear. You know, it's like I put in this effort, this, this should happen. I should be rewarded by the people that notice, right? Whereas like the actual result of their work isn't in their scope. They're not thinking like, well, what I did made money or didn't make money for the company. They don't even know most of the time. Um, Maybe sometimes, but most of the time not. Whereas the person who's the owner is like very aware of how poorly things are working when they're not working, you know, but he also has to kind of manage these people that are working linearly. Right. So when you make it, and I haven't made it yet, but when but when you make it uh, and you get paid and everyone goes, oh, 
you know, he started this business and it's whatever. Like he, you know, he's rich or he made it. They don't have any idea how long you didn't make it for. They have no clue. They right. have no clue like how many hours you worked for for negative dollars, you know, or took from another job or or took a side job or planted vegetables in your yard to feed your family or anything. They just don't know. So being self-employed is the commitment to nonlinear success, right? It's the commitment to just living the life that you want to live and putting as much effort as you can into it. And hopefully if you do it right, it'll work, but there's no guarantee, you know, like a lot of things can happen that'll, that'll thwart that. Well, and I think there's just so many people out there that are not willing to put in that effort to, or they just don't understand what it would be like to work and work and work and work for nothing. And it's like the delayed gratification. It's like with, you know, I've got working in the restaurant. I've always, I've always worked in restaurants and like, that's always just like, that's in a way like a, a, my trade, mm -hmm. right? I know I can do this and make this much money and go home and, and leave. So I've continued to do that. I've continued to try to build my business now with like the real estate. I'm trying to build my real estate business and all of the profits that are coming out or quote unquote profits or whatever, just get dumped back into the business and trying to build it back up to the point, like you said, where you do get paid, where you can take that paycheck and not have to worry because everything has kind of started to stabilize a little bit. Yeah. I mean, a career path is probably too demanding to be able to do like a, like a corporate career path is probably too difficult to do that and moonlight as an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs almost always have some sort of a job, right? Or an income source of some sort, whether they invest in NFTs. <laughs> I'm seeing people do this now and I'm like, I could have just done that, you know? Uh, but you know, it's like you sling pizzas or you, whatever, whatever it is you do, you, you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You pay the bills and you fund your dream. Right. And a, and a career path, like I get it. Like you put in, tons of money into an education and and probably most of what you spend on that was to make connections and then you're keeping those connections alive by using them through business they die if you don't keep them um so you can't have a gap in your resume that's years you you know a lot of that pressure doesn't allow for entrepreneurship but also what it does is it makes you negative to it like they just think well i don't have an idea i don't really have a, a passion or an idea or this or that if they're happy doing what they're doing, great. I mean, who am I to say that that's better or worse? Like that's sounds fantastic to be a lawyer and be happy about it, right? Or whatever. Um, but I would never be. I would just wouldn't be happy unless I could wake up in the morning and create my own day. You know, um, I'm also not happy unless I'm like ultimately very successful, and I have no idea what that even means. I'm just driven to be successful in some way that ultimately maybe satisfies me. I'll figure that out when I'm older, I guess, but that's kind of how I am. I just, I just want to make something of myself. So I don't see a way in doing that, like by going to school and becoming an architect or something like that. It's like, then I'd have to do math well, and I don't do that. <laughs> I have to really learn how to, that's the great thing about being an entrepreneur is you don't have to be an expert in any one thing. You just have to be uh, awake and pivotable, uh, able to pivot and, you know, like, fundamentally sound with people well and how much does uh your partnership play a role in that as far as like what you can do and what you can what what you have what's in your skill set what's not in your skill set and what is in your area of things that you want to be doing and you don't want to be doing um being being a partner being a good partner is as much a skill as anything um and i think a lot of what being a partner is is recognizing that you're working for the other person and um, and that they are for you. So it's it gets very hairy if one party isn't putting in the effort, right, or isn't able to do their, their side of things. It gets very hairy. But what makes a good partnership is to understand the things you can't do that they do well. And if neither one of you do it, then you address it. It's the communication um, because – there's like for my per personal partnership, I don't want to touch the financial end of things in terms of balancing books. I don't have a background in it. I don't want to, I, I could learn it, but I want to focus my efforts on 
relationships, growth, building, um, people, um, sales. And that's what I think I'm good at, whether I am or not. That's what I think I'm good at. And I want to be able to feel comfortable that things are operating well on the back end of things. So that's what works well for my partnership. Um, a lot of other people do it differently. I don't, I can't really comment on that, but it's for us, it's like we have little, little mini powwows constantly, um, where we talk for an hour about which direction we're going in and it changes fast. So we have to have these little talks constantly. And then we bring somebody in that's working for us or consulting for us, or we need to learn something and we have another one. And that's really what it is. It's like a constant communication to, uh, to cover the gaps and also to recognize the opportunity because ultimately that's where you're going, right? Like you don't want to be like tunnel vision towards this one thing that doesn't work. You got to push towards the areas that are working. Well, and I think entrepreneurship or just business ownership in general is like very lonely because most people aren't business owners. Most people are employees. So it's, there's less people that really understand the struggle you're going through in a lot of ways. And to have someone who's got a shared vision, who's equally excited and really in the trenches with you, I think can help make the good times better as well as the bad times better. Oh, for sure. The good times are very good when you have a partner because it's like you get to celebrate, you know. Um, kind of one of the realizations that I've had really very recently um, is that I'm only a good owner. I'm the best at what I do when I'm – giving more to my employees than they are to me. Um, And it's hard to do. It's hard to do when you feel like, well, they don't care about me the way I care about them, right? It's very easy to get kind of within organizations to have resentment either between employees because like one isn't helping the other, you know, so-and-so didn't clean and I came in and after them and then it's not cleaned, right? So these things are all constantly happening. Um, But in, in terms of building a culture, which is, what my job is. Um, if I'm not able to give more to my employee than they expect, or than they would expect to give back to somebody, then ultimately they're not going to care. Right. Because there's, there's an imbalance with value with the employee where everybody thinks they're worth more than they are. Like everybody in the world thinks they should get paid more, should be worth more. And we don't really know who really is worth the most or the least. We don't know who that is. But as an owner, if you're not fundamentally picking up the employee and getting the most out of them, then you're failing, right? And and I've I've failed with a number of employees that way where I just looked at them and said, they don't care. Why do I want them around? Like, get them out of here. You know, bring somebody else in. And I think that happens a ton. It's like, just get them out of here, you know? But did you really win? Like, what if you took that person and you found out what was ailing them, right? And you said, I got you. Like, let's, let's get this. What do you got? What do you need? And they tell you and you, and you can provide it. And then they go, I'm going to work for that guy. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to push, right? Like we have that with Marshall for sure. Marshall will cry his eyes out because he's like overstressed. And then I'm like, dude, I love you. Like you're, you're my guy, you know? And he's like, all right, and I'll put in like a 98-hour day because he knows that. And now Marshall's running your print shop, He's running the print shop, yeah. Yeah. throw that out there for anyone. Yeah, so my goal is to like build that kind of relationship in every location I have with people. It's I don't know how possible it is, but that's my job. My job is to foster that relationship and give more to them than than they're giving back, really. And it's not easy to do. Like there's a lot of days I don't want to do it, and I I feel resentful, you know, but that's not at all what being a good owner is. Right. You know? And now, you know, we're talking a little bit about growing, and we, we've only got probably a couple minutes left. I yeah. just want to touch real quick about fi- on Fitchburg, what you've got going on over okay. there. Yeah. Uh, kind of how it came to be maybe a little bit and, and what your plans are. Sure. Yeah. So Rise and Grind and Lemist are open in April um, this year. And l- sorry, last year, 2021. I'm like, what year is it? I don't know. Um so we're almost open a year now. That's crazy. I thought it was like nine months. <laughs> anyway, we opened in April, and uh, around November or December, um, the guys from Redline, Brian Cody and Scott, I forget his last name, um, came 
to us and asked us if we wanted to put a second location underneath their apartment building on Main Street in Fitchburg. And uh, initially it was like, sure, I guess if it works, I don't know, like show us what, what you got. Um, they showed us the spot and we we're like, whoa, this is nice. Like this is a nice location. It's It's got everything you need but it's in Fitchburg. Like, what are you guys doing here? And they brought in all the developers and the team from the town and, and they gave us the infrastructure for like how to build the business plan. And, you know, cause we didn't really expect to open a new one for a couple of years. We, it was on our mind, but we were like, Hey, when we get on our feet, we'll do this. We'll do this again, you know, but this opportunity came along and they, and they kind of laid it out for us and said, well, you know, we can, the town will help you. We'll help you. We'll get it done. Um, and, so we went into overdrive and now we're at the point where we're probably going to open the summer. Um, I would say probably June, I'm guessing, but in Fitchburg, it's going to be, uh, coffee centric teas, maybe some cold pressed juices. I have to work on that a little bit. Um, we'll have the smoothies, we'll have food, sandwiches, breakfast sandwiches, paninis, things like that. Um, maybe some pre-made meals and it'll be more of a, a coffee shop, Wi-Fi lounge, um, you know, sit down, have a cold nitro cold brew, um, have the best cup of coffee around and get a little bit of the vibe, buy some merch. Um, you know, it's a spot. Whereas in Lemonster, it's located in Empire Athletics, which is a growing gym. So we're like a supplement shop with protein shakes and coffee. So, and we sell our merch. So obviously the stuff we print. So that's, it's, it's a different direction in Fitchburg. It's a little bit more you know, coffee shop, main street, a lot more customers every day. Um, and that's the opportunity there. So it looks really promising. We're, we're very, very psyched. We have meetings this week, um, kind of to finalize the lease and then we can like really celebrate after that. And then also do all the work, which is the scary part. We've started like planning it all out, but we already know what's coming when construction starts. It's a, it's a whirlwind. So, but we're ready for it. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah, you know, obviously you and I have talked for many hours before this and probably will continue to after, but I want to be respectful of your time tonight. I think that's probably a great place to leave it. Cool. Thank you so much for coming down here. I mean, this was awesome. I hope I can't wait for people to check this out, learn a little bit about you and see. Yeah, it's all fun. Stuff it's going fun doing on. podcasts. I don't know. Talking about myself is a little weird, but it's cool. I mean, I think it's good. I think it's good to get your story out there and uh, share it with future customers and employees. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in with us. We do this to share the stories of some of the incredible individuals in your community. All we ask in return is if you found value from this episode, please share it with someone else who may also gain value from the show. Please feel free to rate or review the show. Your feedback helps us give you more of what you want. Until next time, I'm Tim Lanza, and this was another Local Legacy.